Never hit your children, my father told me, because they'll grow up and write about it. Hey, cats and kittens, come closer. Gather round, grab a seat. It's story time. Everybody loves a story. I'm going to tell you a story. It's story time. Everybody take out your trash pamphlets. Today's story starts on page... Wait a minute. We're not reading this story. I was 10 years old. My mom was furious. She screamed at me through the parking lot, dragging me toward her car. She pulled a flat hairbrush out of her purse and told me to lie face down on the back seat. Not with the brush, I begged in tears. No, she said, get on your stomach. The human response to fear, they say, is to fight or to fly, but there are moments when neither is possible. For me to get on my stomach and offer up the sexual center of my body against my will, I had to choke down the human inside me until she stopped my breath. It felt like the most erotic part of my body was being violated against my will in a way that was profoundly sexual to me, because that's exactly what was happening. Take down your pants, she said coldly. I want to see if you're bruised. No, I said, it's my body. Do what I say or I'll spank you again, she replied. Simmering with rage, I pulled down my pants and underwear and showed her my butt. She touched one cheek with the tip of her finger. You have a bruise there, she said. She moved her finger to the other cheek and there. I would not speak about this memory, not to anyone, not even to myself, for more than a decade. Are spanking fetishes caused by childhood trauma? Here's the theory. Beating a child is torture, and the natural reaction to being tortured is to reject the torturer. But children are in a uniquely vulnerable position. They are entirely dependent on their parents for their very means of survival. So when your torturer is also your parent, rejection is not an option. Therefore, the theory goes, some children cope with the trauma of being tortured by a person they are unable to reject by eroticizing that experience. Ergo, spanking fetishism. That theory is bullshit, and I'm going to explain why. But first, I want to say this. I know that some of you out there do believe your fetishes were caused by childhood trauma. I don't think you're correct. And I hope I can change your minds because I believe that theory is really damaging. That being said, if you sincerely believe that your sexuality is a response to trauma, my most important messages to you are these. First, I am so, so sorry that you were abused. You didn't deserve it. Second, you are the world's single greatest leading expert on your own life, your body, and your sexuality. In this video, I'm going to argue that spanking fetishes are not caused by childhood trauma, but at the end of the day, you know you. I'm grateful to you for hearing me out, but no one knows more about your story than you do. Not even me. Okay, so obviously I had a pretty traumatic spanking experience as a child. So how can I sit here and argue with such absolute certainty that my own sexuality was not formed by childhood trauma when the evidence of my own life seems to prove otherwise? One, the trauma theory is boring. The theory that spanking fetishes are caused by eroticization of traumatic childhood spankings is boring. Like, really boring. And that becomes apparent when you try to apply the same logic to literally any other sexual orientation, interest, or preference. Here, I'll show you. Let's play... Name that trauma! Let's start the timer. How many sexualities can I explain away with childhood trauma? First, People who are super into boobs. Uh, okay. Well, um, breast milk feeds babies, so sexual attraction to breasts is obviously an eroticized response to traumatic hunger in infancy. Next. Okay. Um, women who just crave a big, thick, 
Oh, oh, okay, um, this one is easy. Little girls grow up under the trauma of patriarchy, so clearly any woman who is attracted to the male phallus has merely eroticized the trauma of penis envy. Next, men who are attracted to other men. <sighs> okay, um, men who are attracted to other men are clearly responding to the trauma of absent fathers and overbearing mothers, so... Wait. Oh. Really? Yikes. Um, okay. So I just got word that the theory that male homosexuality is caused by absent fathers and overbearing mothers really was the actual psychiatric explanation for gay men for like a couple of decades until it was wildly disproved. So, yikes. Next, people who like to have sex. Well, I mean, this is just obvious, obvious trauma. Clearly, at some point in childhood, they had the traumatic realization that they are mortal and have therefore eroticized the fear of death by becoming sexually obsessed with the means of procreation. I mean, your heart has to go out to them, really. Do you see how silly and, frankly, how boring the trauma logic sounds when I apply it to more normative sexual interests? There is no clear reproductive reason why so many people are attracted to boobs. Sucking a lady's giant tats does not a baby make, but that's a really normative sexual interest, so people don't feel the need to try to explain it away with trauma. Sexuality is weird. It doesn't fit into boring causal boxes. Two, the trauma theory doesn't cover all of us. Some spanking fetishists were never spanked as kids. Never. Not once. Uh, clearly they were, but just forgot about it. Or like, blocked it out because it was so traumatic. Hard nope. That theory is really condescending. Some people truly can conclude with certainty that they weren't spanked as kids. For today's show and tell, let me present Dan, the non-traumatized pervert. Dan, the non-traumatized pervert. Damen und Herren of the Academy, here we have the case study of the non-traumatized pervert. The subject was not spanked as a child, and we can conclude this based on several pieces of evidence. Mm -hmm. First, the subject has no memories of being hit. I mean, my parents definitely yelled sometimes, uh, but they never hit me, and they, they never even threatened to spank me. Second, the subject has no memories of his younger sisters being hit. Right, like, if they spanked me and I just forgot about it, it seems like they would have done the same thing to my little sisters. Um, but, like, no, they definitely didn't. I'd remember. Third, the subject has parents who were themselves not spanked in childhood. What can I say? Um, my grandparents were progressive. Uh, sometimes it's good to be European. Um, but if, if my parents never got spanked, it seems really unlikely they would go on to give me some super traumatic spanking that I just don't remember somehow. So, we can conclude that there are some spanking fetishists who were not spanked in childhood, and therefore the trauma theory cannot account for all of us. I also want to add, I get a lot of emails from all around the world, and some of those emails come from spanking fetishists in countries like Sweden, which outlawed child battery way back in 1979. So, Seriously, there are spanking fetishists who not only were not spanked as children, they didn't even grow up in places with normalized references to spanking. The bottom line is, the trauma theory just fails. Three, the trauma theory is increasingly unsupported by science. Look, I don't usually like to appeal to psychiatric science because it has been super wrong about sexuality for a really long time. 
Psychiatry has a history of pathologizing and stigmatizing masturbation, homosexuality, and a whole bunch of other things that are really healthy and natural. So I don't like to default to psychiatric authority. Another reason I don't like to default to academic studies on this subject is that people aren't studying spanking fetishes specifically. There are some studies about BDSM, but like I've said a number of times, although spankos are a branch of the broader BDSM tree, we are also definitely our own thing. I've seen relationships between BDSM people and spanking fetishists fail, specifically because we really are different. So I'm not convinced that existing academic work about our cousins always necessarily applies to us. But I know many people will not trust a chick like me when there are peer-reviewed publications to be had. So let's talk about some of the studies. A 2008 study from the Journal of Psychology and Human Sexuality concluded, quote, Although psychoanalytic literature suggests that high levels of certain types of psychopathology should be prevalent among BDSM practitioners, this sample failed to produce widespread high levels of psychopathology on psychometric measures of depression, anxiety, obsessive compulsion, psychological sadism, psychological masochism, or PTSD. In fact, on measures of clinical psychopathology and severe personality pathology, this sample appeared to be comparable to both published test norms and to dsm 4 tr estimates for the general population. In other words, BDSM practitioners are psychologically healthy, or, you know, at least we're not more f***ed up than everyone else. A 2013 study in the Journal of Sexual Medicine found that, quote, Practitioners of bondage, discipline, sadism and masochism, or BDSM, score better on a variety of personality and psychological measures than vanilla people who don't engage in unusual sex acts. The bottom line is, we don't know what causes sexual fetishes or paraphilias. I reached out to one of my friends, Dr. David Lay, who is a clinical psychologist and author in New Mexico. He said, quote, We don't really know where paraphilias come from. Anyone who says differently is spinning rhetoric. There's no evidence childhood experiences cause them. He's right. We don't know where fetishes come from, but I do know what does not cause them. And that's trauma. Human sexuality is way more interesting than that. 